This morning is going to be a little bit of a different service. Um, at the end, we plan on uh, taking communion together. Uh, I think Thanksgiving time is a wonderful time to be able to take communion. And I want you, as we go through this, to please stick with me. How I prepare most of my sermons, um, I have thoughts in my head, and I ask myself questions about those thoughts and process them as we go through the scriptures, and that's how I prepare my sermons. And so my conclusion is, 95% of the time, the answer to all of those questions. And this morning is no different. But I don't want you to get lost before we get there. Uh, so stick with me as we go through. I believe the Lord has a fantastic answer for us this morning. And so I'd like to take you through it. As we begin, I have a few questions for you. The, all of these questions start, have you ever, or are you now? Have you ever, or are you now? We're going to start with Exodus chapter 20, and I've paraphrased a lot of these because, well, this is more or less 20 questions. And I can come up with infinite ones, but this is more or less 20 questions uh, about our lives. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, if you would turn it into a question, have you ever, or are you now, made or making anything more important than God in your life? Well, that's a, I could preach one whole sermon on that. In fact, I could probably preach one whole sermon on any one of these questions. But we won't. Have you made or are you making anything more important than God in your life right now? Is there any idols? In verse 4 of Exodus chapter 20, are you now or have you ever worshipped something made more than God? Are you worshiping something now that's been made more than God? It can be all kinds of things. Anything made of hands. Back in these times, there were little wooden sculptures or, or metal sculptures or, or price, priceless jewels that they would make and they would worship them. Today, we have all kinds of different things that we worship. We just don't call it that. But we spend our entire lives trying to get those same things. Have you ever or are you now misusing God's name? Or are you claiming that you're a Christian and not living like you are? Because that's also taking the Lord's name in vain. Having the badge of Christianity, claiming a Christian and then living as a sinner. Have you ever, or are you now, not using the Sabbath day as a holy day? And by the way, that's not Sunday. <laughs> From Genesis chapter 1, that's been Saturday. You can deal with that how you want. I'm just saying. Have you, are you using it now as a holy day? Or have you ever, or are you now, working on the Lord's day? Have you ever, or are you now, dishonoring your parents? And I would like to put just a little bit of thought into that. It has nothing to do with the quality of the parents that you receive. If you go to that verse, it doesn't put any responsibility on your parents. The responsibility is on you that you would honor them. So have you ever, or are you now, dishonoring? Have you ever murdered? Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. Have you ever had a sinful relationship with a married person that isn't your spouse? It's a long definition just to say adultery, but I wanted to make sure we got it in there. Have you ever cheated someone or have you stolen from someone? Have you ever testified falsely or have you ever lied? Have you ever, or are you now, wanting something else that someone else has? And probably at this point you'd say, yeah, somebody else is faster. 
So we've been in Exodus chapter 20 very briefly. I'd like to do the same thing now in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. And in verse 13, he says, I tell you to do this. You heard this, but I tell you to do this. So let's translate that into a question. Have you ever, or are you now, have you lost your impact or your flavor in the world around you? Do people around you not even realize that you're a Christian? Has your salt lost its flavor? Have you hidden your witness? Verse 15. Jesus said here, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a lampstand, and it gives light into all who are in the house. Have you hidden your witness? Have you called someone a fool? Have you looked at a woman or a man and lusted after her? Verse 28. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman... And it's also included a man. To lust after her has already committed adultery within her heart. Verse 32. Have you ever, or are you now, have you divorced your spouse not because of sexual immorality? Your choice. I want to clarify that. It takes two, and sometimes the other party doesn't want to be in it. That's not your fault. That's theirs. But... Have you ever said, I swear to God, and then made some kind of promise? Has your yea not been yea, and your no not been no? Have you made a promise and not kept it? Verse 37 of Matthew chapter 5. Have you ever tried to get revenge? Tried to tear someone down, verbally assault them, gossiped about them, or tried to make someone else look bad? Verses 44 and 45, Jesus said, But I say to you, love your enemies, Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And then verse 45 says that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. The idea is if you're not doing those things, you don't have the opportunity to be sons of your Father in heaven. Woo! That's kind of harsh, isn't it? And let's just round it out with a good one-two punch. Have you been, or are you now, not being spiritually perfect? Because Jesus said, therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your, have, your Father in heaven is perfect. <coughs> Woo! How you feeling? How you doing? Aren't you all excited? Those were 18 questions. Let's just round it out with 20. Are you showing partiality? James chapter 2 verse 10. And I had just added this one. Do you spend more time worshiping Hollywood than you worship God in his word? Feel convicted yet? We could go on. We could name the two greatest commandments. That you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I mean, have you been doing that? Or have you failed to do that? Have you failed to love your neighbor as yourself? I know it's probably, if we're honest, it's a little convicting. But just in case I didn't hit you all, somewhere between the eyes, Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable, and there is none who does good no, not one. And if that didn't convince you, he goes down a little further in verse 23 and says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. So, to put you all on the spot, by raised hands, have you ever or are you currently now in violation of the law of God who would be honest enough to say that one of those you have at least broken by raised hands. <laughs> hey, okay, at least I'm not alone. <laughs> yeah, that hits us all. Yeah. yeah. At some point, we all really messed up. Right. And we might make some humor or some light of it. But I, this week, I was, it wasn't even me, I didn't do it. But I was in a situation where someone treated me like I used to treat everybody else. 
And I got tapped on the shoulder by the Holy Spirit and says, you see where the Lord brought you? There's still hope for that person yet. Right. Because I remember who I used to be. Right. And I do. I run in the exact opposite direction as often as I can because I don't want to be that person anymore. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I want to tell you, if you think that was bad, don't worry. This sermon's only going to get worse before it finally gets better. So we've gone through our spiritual superiority that we've all got it, right? Let's do Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, and start looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. <laughs> In his life, Jesus comforted the fearful, even though they should have trusted him. He brought the dead to life, even if they didn't deserve it. He provided food for the hungry when they should have been providing for themselves. He had compassion on the weary, even when they let him bleed sweat drops of blood in the garden. He had mercy on the sinners who beat him, spit on him, and mocked him. And finally, in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, he laid down his life willingly for all of us. Adrian Rogers, some of you may know his name. He's a, he was, I should say, a pastor out of Memphis. And uh, if you haven't heard him preach, you need to. He, he, is a, he was a fantastic pastor man of God and excellent worship. And I was listening to one of his sermons this week and I heard this quote and I had to search through like four different of his sermons before I could go back to the quote because I'll find it in a needle in a haystack because I wanted this quote for this morning when I'm talking about Christ's life. Adrian said, he never wrote a book as far as we know. I'll interject and say he did write seven letters in Revelation, but as of writing books, we don't know that he ever did. But more books have been written about him than any other person in history. He never painted a picture, never made a sculpture, or wrote a poem as far as we know. But his life has been an inspiration for music, art, literature, and films for 2,000 years. He never raised an army, but millions of people have laid down their lives for him. He never traveled far in his life, not much more than 180 miles, and yet his influence is worldwide. He never spoke to more than a few thousand people at a time, though right about now, some 31% of the world, 2.832 billion people, claim his name and follow him. His ministry was only three years, but today his message goes around the world. He, had never, he never had any formal education as far as we know, and yet thousands of schools and universities were built <coughs> on his name. Well, then we look at our lives and we're like, man, <laughs> woo, I don't think we measure up, do we? Peter says it this way, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us as an example that you should follow his footsteps. We look at our previous lives, and they're way down here. And we didn't take a lot of time in detail, but we looked at Jesus' life just very briefly, and he's way up there. And then Peter says, oh yeah, and he walked it so that you walk it. He did it so that you can. He did it so that you would be able to walk in his footsteps and do what he did. In some places, he said... Greater things than I do, you will do. <laughs> How about you all? Boy, that's humbling, isn't it? This goes a little further into Jesus' life. In verse 22, he says, Jesus committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. He suffered and he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. 
Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree. The Bible teacher Tim Keller says that Jesus died on a tree so that we could eat from the tree of life. And I thought that was pretty good. He died on it so that we could eat from it. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says, Jesus, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the bull, blood of bulls and goats and of ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25, Therefore he also is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We talked about what Jesus did on earth, but what he's doing now is saving us to the uttermost because he is at the right hand of the Father praying for you and me. For such a high priest was fitting for us Jesus was holy, is holy, is harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and because and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first of his own sins and then for those of the people. For this he did once and for all when he offered up himself. Every sin that I ever did, Every sin that you ever did. We see in the life of Jesus. Blaise Pascal, godly man, all known throughout history, said, Not only do we not know God except through Jesus Christ, we don't even know ourselves except through Jesus Christ. You see, when I look at Jesus, I realize how short I really am. How I've messed up many a time. When I see all that Jesus went through for me, it breaks my heart that I would take it so flippantly. That I would take it so for granted. That I would not be shouting it from the rooftops. In our Ephesians study, it's been so challenging to me, and we, and we talked about it last Wednesday night, the idea that if he did really die for my sins, and he really made me alive to righteousness, why don't I live like it? Why don't I talk like it? Why don't I pray like it? When we look at ourselves in the mirror of God's holy word and the standard in which he set and Jesus' life. We see who we really are in Jesus. But that's not all that he said here. Pascal also said, well, not only when we look at Jesus do we see ourselves, but when we look at Jesus, we also see the Father. Because Christ is the exact representation of the Father in human flesh. God the Father's heart is to be merciful and forgiving to fallen humans. And how we know this is because we can see the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus in the life that he lived. Yeah. Jesus went to the extremest lengths that we might be saved from who we once were or who we are. <coughs> I don't know about you, but as I look back at my life, I needed to be saved from my past, but I also need to be saved from my present. I'm not saying I'm in out, out and out local sin. I'm not saying that. But as I compare myself to Christ, like Peter says in 121 that we read, 
I realize I've got a long ways to go to be stepping in his footsteps. Right. And I need to be saved from where I'm at right now. Amen. I am so thankful that I'm not who I was or who I will be today. Because he's not done with me yet. I have a long way to go. How about you? I need help. How about you? Amen. To live up to that expectation, to live up to that standard, to live up to that example that he said, I need help for today. Right. Just like I needed help yesterday. Last set of verses. Hebrews chapter 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we don't have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Because he lived it without sin, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I once in sin's darkest night, I was wandering long. A stranger to mercy I stood. But the Savior came nigh when he heard my faith cry. And he put my sins under his blood. They are covered by the blood. They are covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by his blood. My iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. From the burden I carry, now I am set free. For Jesus has lifted my load. Oh, the love and the grace I received in its place when he put my sins under the blood. They are covered by the blood. They are covered by his blood. My sins are all covered by his blood. My iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. I can ne'er understand why he saw even me, why his life blood on Calvary did flow. But sufficient for me, since he died on the tree, he had put my sins under the blood. They are covered by the blood, they are covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by his blood. My iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. Now he comes to my heart and removes every care. He bears all my cumbering load in a pathway replete with his love at my feet. Since he put my sins under the blood. Can you testify and sing with me? They are covered by the blood. They are covered by his blood. My sins are all covered by his blood. My iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? In this Thanksgiving season, there's a lot of things that we have to be thankful for. But first and foremost, is that he would see those people that we once were, and he saved us anyway. He bears the scars anyway. He looks at our lostness and pulls us out of it. That's what we have to be thankful for. Amen. That he 
he doesn't call us sinners any longer. We're saints. Amen. We're saints. I heard a Bible study this last week. And uh, it was actually my uncle's Bible study. And he said something that hit me. When they were doing the sacrifices in the Old Testament, they would bring that perfect lamb, that little spotless lamb, and on the day of preparation, they would go and they'd give it to the priest, and the priest would inspect it and make sure there's nothing wrong with it. They would kill that animal, they would drain its blood, and they would take that blood and they would put it on the mercy seat, pour it out. God the Father never once looked at the sinner. No. Nope. God always looked at the sacrifice. When God the Father looks at us, He doesn't see all the sin that we've ever done. He didn't see the sin that we did last week. You know what He sees? When we come in repentance, He sees the nail prints on Jesus' hands. He sees the nail prints in Jesus' feet. The scars that are on His forehead from the thorns that were pressed into His brow. He sees the lacerated back of Christ. The sacrifice that Jesus made. That's what God the Father sees. Amen. When we come in repentance. Amen. Amen. He doesn't look who we were. He looks at the Son. Oh, thank the Lord for all that he endured for you and for me. Amen. Jude chapter 1 verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who is all wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.